Implementation of the plane wave expansion method. Up to this point, we've derived a lot of equations, and in this lecture, we will talk about how to actually use those to do things like calculate photonic band diagrams. That's by far the most common thing done with the plane wave expansion method. Implementation. So let's wrap a black box around our plane wave expansion method for a few minutes. And let's think of this almost like one of those magic eight balls where you ask it a question, you shake it, and out comes an answer. So the inputs to this are a description of the lattice, so that will be our convolution matrices, and a block wave vector. So we are asking a question, hey, in this lattice, what on earth goes in this direction with this wavelength? And we send those inputs into the plane wave expansion method. We shake our magic eight ball and out comes the answer. Out comes eigenvalues, which are the frequencies of the modes and eigenvectors, which are pictures of the modes. Now, eigenvalue problems always have an infinite number of solutions. However, since we have truncated our Fourier expansions to some number of spatial harmonics, there's going to be a limit and we can only resolve so many. If we have 101 spatial harmonics, we're only going to be able to calculate 101 different modes. So what we do is we calculate a beta, throw it into PWEM, get eigenvectors, eigenvalues, go to the next value of beta, get the eigenvalues, go to the next vector. And we do this in a certain pattern and if we line up these eigenvalues, they form bands that we call photonic bands. A question one might ask in the implementation is how many spatial harmonics are enough? There is no equation I can give you to tell you how many will be enough. The absolute answer is to check for convergence. That is run a simulation, get your answer crank up the number of spatial harmonics that you're using, run it again, look at your answer and keep doing that. And you'll notice a trend where as you're increasing the number of spatial harmonics, of course the simulations are taking longer to run as well, but the answer is not changing much anymore. And it's sort of up to you to figure out where you are along that curve to say that you're converged. And we would like the simulations to run fast, yet give us accurate enough results. Now, even though I can't do anything for you other than that, one thing that I can do is give you some rule of thumb of where to start or to give you sort of a gut feel of how many might be enough. And the short answer is you're probably going to want to use somewhere around 9, 11 for every wavelength large your device is. And But even that can change a little bit just depending on the the dielectric contrast, the size of your structures. And what I have below here is just a bunch of examples I wanna take you through. So let's start with this first unit cell at the upper left. So we're looking at a unit cell. It is completely uniform in the X direction. That tells me right away, I only need one spatial harmonic in that direction. In the vertical direction, I'm seeing contrast, so I know I'll need spatial harmonics. It's a rather wide bar and it's rather low index contrast. I might say we only need seven. Now remember, that's not the final answer. It's just a way to arrive at a first guess. Let's go to our second example. Same unit cell, but a thinner bar. Well, thinner bars will require more spatial harmonics to resolve. So I might wanna crank it up to like 15 spatial harmonics. It's still uniform in the X direction, so we still only need one harmonic in the X direction. Now we have this wide bar again, but now it's uniform in the Y direction. So I would set the number of spatial harmonics in the Y direction to one. In the X direction, it's a nice fat bar. It's low contrast. So I might guess seven. Skinny bar in the vertical direction. We still only need one spatial harmonic in the vertical direction, but because it's a skinny bar, I'm gonna require more spatial harmonics. Five feature, fine features require more spatial harmonics. Now we have a cross, but it's very thin. So 
we're probably going to need a lot of spatial harmonics in both directions. We have another cross, but they're nice fat bars with rather low contrast. So we won't need as many spatial harmonics, but we'll still need probably about seven. Now let's move on to this ellipse. Well, in the horizontal direction, it's starting to get a little bit thin, but still low contrast. So maybe I'll go with 11 harmonics. In the vertical direction, it's nice and wide and low contrast. So it may only need something like seven. Now we're down at the lower left. Well, we have a fat bar vertically, low contrast. So a relatively low number of harmonics, seven. Horizontally, now we have a fine feature to resolve. Probably need about 15 harmonics. It's still low contrast, but I'll throw out 15. Now we'll start going higher contrast. Here's a skinny bar, high contrast. It's uniform in the X direction, so we still only need one spatial harmonic in the X direction. Skinny in the Y direction and high contrast. So we probably need maybe 25 spatial harmonics now in the Y direction. Onto a circle, oh, well, this kind of acts like a fat bar, but it's like a fat bar in both directions. So in terms of the number of spatial harmonics, I'm thinking a lot like this same lattice. And we probably only need maybe seven by seven. Same circle, but now high contrast. Well, we're gonna need more spatial harmonics. So I'm thinking maybe more 21 by 21. More circles, but these are skinny circles. Low contrast, we were using seven for our previous low contrast circle, but now it's very small. We have some fine features to resolve. We'll need more spatial harmonics to resolve those. Same unit cell, but high contrast, we'll need even more. Now let's move on to a high contrast ellipse. It's somewhat thin in the horizontal direction and high contrast. So I'm thinking maybe 21 spatial harmonics. Nice and fat vertically, but still high contrast. So I might throw out 13. And I'll, I'll remind you again, these numbers are not conclusive. This is just sort of what's in my head and how I can look at a unit cell and, and make a decent first guess of how many spatial harmonics I think will be needed. But always, always, always check for convergence. That should be standard habit. So we've run PWEM and we get our eigenvalues back. How do we normalize those? Well, we set up our eigenvalue to give us K naught squared. So what do we do with that? Well, K naught, the free space wave number is also frequency, our angular frequency, radians per second. This isn't the ordinary frequency. That's not the one that's in Hertz. This is radians per second. But omega divided by the speed of light, which is just a constant, is our K naught. So K naught we interpret as frequency. Right? It is frequency, but you know, divided by the speed of light. So not exactly frequency, but we think of it as frequency. So that's what K naught is. So we essentially have frequency as our eigenvalues. Well, typically we want to normalize the frequency in the vertical axis of a band diagram or an isofrequency contour plot or something like that. And very often it's written this way and well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do we normalize it to get here? Well, first we get our eigenvalue, we take the square root of it. So now that's just K naught, but if we multiply by A, divide by two pi, we end up here, omega A or two pi C. And that is how the vertical axis on most band diagrams is labeled. And I think physicists do that. I think they're crazy. Uh, cause I can look at that and what the heck does that mean? I don't know, but you know what this also means? This is the same thing as a over wavelength. And so this second one is actually how we use it. So I don't label my band diagrams this way. I think that's completely silly. I think, I think physicists just want to make things look more complicated. The vertical axis, our normalized frequency is just lattice constant over wavelength. And that is an incredibly meaningful number because we can calculate our bands and let's say we have a band gap that occurs at a normalized frequency of one. And maybe we want to design a device that works at red light that's 632 nanometers. And I might wonder what is the lattice constant to make this work for my red light? 
well, I'll just bring this lambda naught over here. I just multiply that normalized frequency by my wavelength. That means I will need a lattice constant of 632 nanometers. And it works that easily. And we can design the scale of a lattice to, to work at whatever wavelength or frequency we want. So I will always label mine with A over lambda, except sometimes in my lectures I do it this way, just so when people see this, they will recognize it. So that's how we normalize. We take the square root, we multiply by our lattice constant A, and then divide by 2 pi. And that's our normalized frequency. So let's actually talk about how the plane wave expansion method works. We have all the equations. We've got some implementation details now. Let's step through how this works. So we're going to start. And the first thing is we need to define our problem. What does our device look like? What are its feature sizes? What is its permittivity? What is its permeability? What do we want to learn? All of these sorts of things. And typically we'll define all of those numbers in a dashboard at the head of our code. First thing I like to do, given dimensions, material properties, is build very high resolution grids that have the permeability and permittivity on them. So we can see pictures of our unit cell. And these grids typically have a thousand by a thousand points, something really high like that. And that's so that we can calculate accurate Fourier coefficients from those. Given those, we'll hand those to our convmat function, and that builds our convolution matrices. If we have a homogeneous uh, unit cell, we'll get a diagonal convolution matrix. Otherwise, we'll get something that is a full matrix, but it'll look something like this, where the bigger numbers tend to run down the center diagonal. Just before we enter the main loop of the algorithm, we will want to compute our list of block wave vectors. Here, we're probably either marching around the perimeter of an irreducible Brillouin zone, and we need to lay out you know, maybe a couple hundred block wave vectors or beta values. If we're calculating isofrequency contours, we're doing some kind of a mesh grid over the Brillouin zone. But we have this whole list of block wave vectors, and we want to run the plane wave expansion method on each one of them. So we, now we enter this loop, we iterate. And for each one of these block wave vectors, we run the plane wave expansion method, which step one is to actually calculate the plane wave expansion. And since that beta term is sitting there, this is different for every value of beta. But we'll end up building these diagonal K matrices that have all of the components of the wave vectors. And notice we're expanding about the reciprocal lattice vectors. From there, we'll build the eigenvalue problem, and that could be the E mode or the H mode. We'll solve the eigenvalue problem. That's calling eig. Everything runs pretty fast. Some slow points are this convolution matrix calculation, but that's still pretty fast, and it only happens once. We're not going to do that inside of our loop. And even though this is like the shortest line of code, this is also the slowest. This is where things tend to bog down. And there's not a whole lot we can do to improve the speed. MATLAB is pretty fast. We would have to know something else uh, to have some kind of exception to, to calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues faster. So we solve our eigenvalue problem. Um, we, we always want to get the eigenvalues. Sometimes we may want the eigenvectors. Typically for band diagrams and isofrequency contours, I am only calculating the eigenvalues. Given the eigenvalue, we normalize that. So we take the square root, we multiply by a, and we divide by 2 pi. And then, of course, record the data. And this keeps repeating over all of the block wave vectors we're interested in. And when we're finally done, well, we're done. We can plot our band diagram. We can plot our isofrequency contours. Calculation of photonic band diagrams. So a band diagram is a reasonably quick thing to calculate that tells us a lot about this photonic crystal. It's only valid for a photonic crystal of infinite extent, and of course those don't really exist, and they're finite, but it's usually a very good approximation. Simulating a finite photonic crystal is a very difficult and much more computationally intensive thing. This is something that's fast and simple, and we can still get a lot of the behavior. We can look for band gaps. For some reason, I chose to draw bands here that don't have a band gap, but there is almost a band gap here. If you can imagine this little hump were lower, 
and or this one were higher, we would have a band gap, a span of frequencies where there are no bands. And photonic crystals act like mirrors in the band gaps. We look at the shapes of these bands and we can get different dispersion properties from that. So there's a lot we can do by looking at the band diagram. And this, the plane wave expansion method is probably the dominant method that people use to calculate band diagrams for periodic structures, especially dielectric structures. So what does all this stuff mean? And the first time I looked at a band diagram, I was completely confused. I'm looking at all these symbols going across here and I had no idea really what was happening. And what I learned was, I had to learn what a Berluin zone was. Here's a face center cubic photonic crystal. Here's its Berluin zone. I had to learn about an irreducible Berluin zone. That's the smallest piece of the Berluin zone that actually characterizes the entire Berluin zone. And that's just taking advantage of extra symmetry in the lattice. These vertices are called the key points of symmetry. Now, really, to learn everything about this lattice, we would have to iterate through every single beta throughout this entire volume enclosed by the irreducible Berluin zone. However, that's a lot of points. Instead, what is said is the band extremes almost always occur at the key points of symmetry. Almost always, yes, we can miss things. And so, Instead of going in and filling this entire volume in and solving each one of those points, we will pick a path around the perimeter of the Berluin zone. So here's the Berluin zone, and here's the path I just happened to choose. Let's go from U to X to Gamma to L to K to W. And even though this, this path is meandering throughout three dimensions in the Berluin zone or in K space, we can stretch this out to a single line, and that is the horizontal axis on the band diagram. And of course, the vertical axis is the normalized frequency. So that's a band diagram. So here is a band diagram being calculated. There's a lot going on here, so we'll, we'll be on this slide for a minute or two. At the far left, I am showing a not just a unit cell but it's a small sample of the lattice a two by two section this happens to be a face centered cubic photonic crystal in the middle is our berluin zone our irreducible berluin zone and this blue vector we see marching around that's the current block wave vector that we're calling the plane wave expansion method and calculating the eigenvalues so in this berluin zone for convenience i'm showing the reciprocal lattice vectors i'm showing the x y and z directions and showing as much as I can here. And on the far right is the photonic band diagram that we are calculating. So the horizontal axis is showing our path around the irreducible Berluin zone. So we would label that as the block wave vector. And the vertical axis is our normalized frequency, which of course is A over lambda naught. I'm not gonna label this in some crazy way like physicists like to do. Ah, I'm picking off physicists way too much. Anyway, what's happening is, we, are ha we have a giant loop and we are iterating over all of these values of the block wave vector. So as this block wave vector is marching around, I, I also drew the block wave vector over here and you can see how the block wave relates to the direction and the period of the lattice. So this is all to scale. You can see the period of the block wave relative to the lattice. But as we're marching around the perimeter of the Berluin zone, re we're really talking about is waves in different directions and different wavelengths. And for each block wave vector, let's say we're at some point here, whatever this block wave vector happens to be, we will call the plane wave expansion method and we will plot the eigenvalues vertically. And as long as we have enough beta points on the horizontal axis, these points form up to align up to form lines that we call our bands. So that's how we're using our plane wave expansion method. And by the way, there's certainly other techniques for solving that eigenvalue problem. This just happens to be a really nice way for dielectric structures, periodic dielectric structures. If you remember from the block diagram, one of the first things we have to do is calculate this list of block wave vectors. So here for a 2D lattice, we have a, our Berluin zone, and we labeled our key points of symmetry. We've identified our irreducible Berluin zone, and we've picked a path. And it looks like we're going to go start at the gamma point, work over to X, work up to M, and down to gamma. And each one of these is showing all the individual points that we selected 
around the perimeter of the Berlouin zone. So we have to calculate this list of block wave vectors. So this is, this is a big array of numbers where I'm using the columns as the actual vector. So our gamma point is that beta x equals zero and beta y equals zero. We're gonna go through some number of points all the way up to x. And so since at the x point, our beta y value is still zero, we have all zeros all the way across. But up here, the numbers will just slowly ramp from zero to 3.14. So you can imagine using like the lin space command in MATLAB to do something like that. Then we proceed from x to m. So it looks like the beta x value doesn't change at all, but our beta y ramps from zero to 3.14. And then both beta x and beta y ramp down to zero at gamma. The only real trick here is notice the gamma to m is a longer distance than m to x. And depending on the symmetry of the lattice, you know, m to x might even be different than gamma to x. But for a square unit cell, gamma to x and x to m will be the same. But m to gamma will be longer. We need to ensure that we have more points here, not only to make it look longer, but there's just more stuff going on. And we want our points to be about the same step size all the way around. So we want to ensure that because on our band diagram, we actually want to convey the relative distances here. We don't want to show gamma to X to M back to gamma being equally spaced. We want these points in between equally spaced, but we'll have more points. So gamma to M looks farther apart. Here's an animation of constructing a band diagram for a two-dimensional lattice. And boy, there's a lot going on here too. So I'm showing the lattice. So it's a square array of dielectric cylinders. And I call them cylinders because these are of infinite extent in the Z direction. So down in the lower left, I'm showing the Berlouin zone. Looks like I'm using a G instead of a symbol gamma. I'm sorry for that. But you see the irreducible Berlouin zone. And this red arrow is showing the current block wave vector as we're marching around the perimeter. So as we're marching around the perimeter, we are plotting our eigenvalues and they're forming the bands. The next thing I'm doing, I brought a little one here and a two here. I'm following the first and second bands and I'm plotting the block modes associated with those. And that'll help us sort of understand what's going on here. So, Let's look at one, actually, let's look at the, the block wave vector compared to the wave over here. Notice we can sort of see some wave fronts. It's more of a bumpy wave, but we can sort of see wave fronts that are always perpendicular to the direction of the block wave vector. We can also see the wavelength stretch and constrict in inverse proportion to what's happening to the block wave vector. As the block wave vector gets longer, the wave is becoming more compressed. And that's because the magnitude of the block wave vector is two pi over wavelength. And so staring at this for a while is really, really helpful. We can, we can see that the wave fronts of our block wave are always perpendicular to the block wave vector. And the wavelength is always reacting to the, the magnitude of the block wave vector changing. And then of course the number two, we can see the same thing up here for the second block mode. Uh, the higher order modes, the wave nature, the, the phase fronts get much harder to recognize. Band two is not bad, but when it gets higher, it's really hard to recognize just by looking at it, what direction the wave is going. But I think this is a really good animation to stare at, to understand really what's happening as we're constructing a band diagram and what all the different things mean. Let's do an actual example and let's calculate a band diagram and go through everything that we would have to go to for a two dimensional photonic crystal with square symmetry. Sometimes these are called electromagnetic band gap materials. So the first thing is we have to define our lattice. So we see a giant lattice on the left here, but really our method focuses on a single unit cell and, and uses periodic boundary conditions. By assuming it's periodic and our expansions, we're essentially using periodic boundary conditions. So it's a dielectric slab with air holes. The, the permittivity, relative permittivity is 9.0. The radius of those holes, we always want to express as some fraction of the lattice constant, 0.35 times A, and we'll let the lattice constant be one. And why one? What does that mean? One meter, one micron? 
Remember, we've normalized that. What we're getting out of the band diagram is A over lambda. We can scale this to work wherever we want to. So that could be one micron, one meter, whatever you want it to be. So in our code, given that unit cell, we have to come up with an array and we have to build that unit cell onto that array such that if we visualize the array, we would see our unit cell. And remember, we need to use many hundreds of points. Clearly what I'm showing here, I'm not showing 500 by 500 points. It's more like 40 by 40 or something like that, uh, just to show you that it's, it's discrete. But we want a whole lot of points here because we're going to use the fast Fourier transform to calculate the Fourier coefficient. And we need many hundreds of points to get accurate Fourier coefficients. But that's step one, build the unit cell onto the grid. And we might have to do this once for permittivity and once for permeability if there's a magnetic response going on. Once we have those really high resolution arrays defining our permeability and permittivity, we call ConvMAT and we build our convolution matrices. Normally the, the permeability is not used, it's all set to one and the permeability convolution matrix is just the identity matrix. And in fact, if I'm making a code where I know I'm not interested in permeability ever, I'll just make that the identity matrix and not even ever really touch it in my code. Uh, here we have permittivity, and of course our convolution matrix is definitely not the identity matrix. The lower order terms are usually along the diagonal and the higher order terms as we, we go off. So we construct our convolution matrices. The next thing we need to do, ultimately we want our list of block wave vectors. But to do that, we need to determine the Berlouin zone, the irreducible Berlouin zone, the key points of symmetry and all that. So we start with the direct lattice. From there, when we have our direct lattice vectors, we can calculate the reciprocal lattice vectors. And the unit cell constructed from the reciprocal lattice vectors is our reciprocal lattice and very close to our Berlouin zone. So to construct the Berlouin zone, here we're in reciprocal space. So these are not dielectric globs. These are just sites in the lattice. But we, we focus on one site and we're gonna draw our Berlouin zone around it. And we look at all the adjacent sites and we go one by one. So we'll, we'll pair it off with this site and we bisect the space between them. Then we go to the next one and we bisect the space between them. We move to the next one, we bisect the space between them. And we march all the way around doing that and eventually we've enclosed an area here. That is our, if you will, Wigner sites unit cell in reciprocal space, which we don't call the Wigner sites unit cell. We call it a Berlouin zone. So that is our Berlouin zone. It's that area around a point in our reciprocal lattice that's closer to that point than any other point in the reciprocal lattice. Now we wanna identify the irreducible Berlouin zone. We have our direct lattice and we have our Berlouin zone, but there's additional symmetry that we can exploit. Our unit cell has left-right symmetry. So will the Berlouin zone. So in fact, we only have to calculate things in half of the Berlouin zone. And then we just fold this over to populate the other half. We don't ever have to do calculations over here. Our unit cell also has up-down symmetry. So we can cut this in half again. And if we now we're down to a quadrant, so we can calculate all of our eigenvalues here, we can fold that over, then take this entire top half and fold it down to cover the bottom half. We have even more symmetry. It's 90 degree rotational symmetry, or we can also think of folding symmetry down the diagonal. And so we can whittle it down to here. And in fact, we can't whittle this down anymore. This little triangular region is our irreducible Berlouin zone. Now notice if this were not a circle, maybe it were a heart. If it were a heart that has left-right symmetry, we would be able to split our Berlouin zone in half, but that would not have up-down symmetry or rotational symmetry or anything like that. And so if this were a heart instead of a circle, this region here would be our irreducible Berlouin zone. Given the irreducible Berlouin zone, we label the key points of symmetry, and there is a convention here. So uh, it's kind of beyond the scope here to cover what that convention is, but I did provide a, a reference down here where you can look up that convention. 
And so we want to calculate these key points of symmetry. It's always a good idea to calculate these as some multiple of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Okay, let's put some numbers in here. So we're going to make our lattice constant 1. We already talked about that doesn't need to be 1 meter or 1 micron. We'll make that 1. So given that, we have our direct lattice vectors, and we have our reciprocal lattice vectors. This is for square symmetry. We have these nice equations to calculate our key points from the reciprocal lattice vectors. So here are our three points of three key points of symmetry that we calculate from the reciprocal lattice vectors. From there, we'll generate our list of block wave vectors and we pick a path. So we'll go from gamma to X to M back to gamma. So our array, our list of block wave vectors needs to look something like that. And we can go ahead and fill in those values. And you can imagine using like lin space command to, to do things like this. And that becomes pretty easy to do. We just want to make sure we don't have repeated values. And we want to make sure that we're conveying the relative distances between the key points of symmetry. You know, this distance is more than this distance. And we need to account for that in our list of block wave vectors. Now we enter the main loop of the plane wave expansion method. Every single beta has its own plane wave expansion because beta is part of that. And so we'll construct our Kx and Ky, our diagonal K matrices. And the way I do that is I'll calculate a one-dimensional array for Kx, a one-dimensional array for Ky, and then mesh grid those. Now we have 2D arrays for our plane wave expansion. And so the only thing left to do there is diagonalize those so we stretch those 2d arrays to a column vector that's what this operation does and then we insert it in a diagonal in a matrix and now we have our two diagonal matrices so we go over our list of block wave vectors calculate all the eigenvalues and when it's done we end up with a big two-dimensional array of numbers like this and we can see all of our eigenvalues. And notice I've sorted them. Um, we can't depend on the order of the modes when we call eig. So I always like to sort them. And so here's our, our lowest values. These are our lowest order modes and they go to higher order modes. And it's rare we're interested in above the fifth order mode. Um, I, I've seen that. Some, some of these quasi periodic lattices will have a band gap somewhere around the 80th band. That's, that's pretty crazy. But for the most part, the interesting stuff is happening in the single digit order bands. So if we were to plot our eigenvalues, just our raw K naught squares, we'd end up with something like this. Um, and there's a lot wrong with this plot. We wanna generate a professional plot next. And here it is. There's some important elements to a professional looking plot. And so let's go through those. So one, it needs a meaningful title. So hey, band diagram of square lattice. Maybe I couldn't got uh, I could have gotten a little more creative, but that'll do. We have labeled our horizontal axis gamma, x, m, and gamma. We're not putting down this axis one, two, three, four, five, or anything else like that. They need to be labeled with the key points of symmetry. Our vertical axis is labeled as normalized frequency. Notice here I chose to do it sort of the, the physicist way, and that's crazy. I mean, that, that doesn't mean anything. So let's just remember the ways that we can do the normalized frequency. All these are the same thing. So here's how most people label it. I think that's nuts. This is the exact same thing, and this is how it's used. So this is how I label my normalized frequency axis. And then this last one is how it's calculated. Our eigenvalue is k naught squared, so we need to take the square root of it. That gives us k naught. Then we multiply by a, divide by 2 pi, and that gives us our a over lambda naught. So that's how we treat our eigenvalues. And the last thing, at a minimum, your band diagram must include a diagram of the Berlouin zone, the irreducible Berlouin zone, and the key points of symmetry. It's also nice if you plotted your unit cell there, but that I guess more of an optional thing or maybe drawn somewhere else. But we absolutely must include the Berlouin zone, irreducible Berlouin zone, and key points of symmetry because that's how we interpret the horizontal axis. 
And so that's it. That's how we build a band diagram. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.